Well, hi, and welcome to another episode of the Social Strategy Mum podcast and live show. I'm very excited today to have the opportunity to introduce you to my coach, the amazing Gemma Bernard. Thanks for being here. Oh, I'm excited. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I'm. Oh, this is going to be a great conversation. So Gemma, to introduce uh, yourself to my audience, to the people who might not know who you are, could you tell us a little bit about what it is that you do? Yeah, sure. So I'm a business mindset coach. I'm also a rapid transformational therapy practitioner, and I help women in business step into their true power so they can authentically create a business they love and create consistent cash and cult confidence and ultimately consistent five figure months and a six figure business. Love it. Yes. I love it. Beautiful elevator pitch, by the way. Um, Thanks. I've worked on it. <laughs> I've worked on it for a while. <laughs> it, it's, yeah, it's, it's always a, a work in progress, I reckon. Uh, yeah. Cool. Okay. So I guess where I wanted to take our audience first um, was to give them a little bit of an idea of the journey that you've been on because you have mm -hmm. been in business now for over 12 months. Um, but there's been some changes and iterations and, and yeah. uh, refining. So can you share Lots with us? Refining. Yeah. Can you share with us um, what that's kind of looked like for you? Oh my goodness. What that's looked like. You know that, have you ever seen that um, Instagram meme that goes around that's got that graph and it's like what you think your journey is going to look like and then what it actually does. And it's yeah. like that. <laughs> yeah. That's my journey, right? <laughs> it's all over the place. It's all over the place. And it's so interesting because I've been having conversations with clients about this recently who are growing their business and talking about the messiness that comes when you're, you know, building a grassroots business, when you're starting from the ground and really creating, you know, the foundations. And, it, you know, you talk about different iterations and that's definitely what it's been. I've had so many iterations of this business. Um, but it all, I mean, it really all started... Gosh, actually almost two years ago, the journey itself started. It wasn't a business at that point in time. I was hoping it would turn into a business, but I started the Manifesting Mums really off an intuitive nudge. It can only be described as that. And it was a it literally to, I mean, Carol, you obviously know me and you know how I talk and sometimes it sounds a little bit crazy and sometimes it feels a little bit that way too, right? But um, it really was a voice that popped in my head that said, become the manifesting mum and share your journey. And that's, that truly is how this business actually began. And so I did, I, I took a huge leap of faith. It felt huge at the time, right? It always does, doesn't mm -hmm. it? It always does when you're getting out of your comfort zone. Cause who am I? Like, who was I to start sharing about manifesting? I was on my own spiritual journey. I was learning at that point too. So who was I to be showing up and, and sharing? But Nonetheless, I felt this call and this pull and there were lots of synchronicities that were going on. And so I started a Facebook group called the Manifesting Mums Facebook group within a matter of um, weeks. I'd been wanting to start a podcast since earlier in the year. Within a matter of weeks, I went, you know, I'm just going to do it. I started a podcast and um, the journey began, right? And it really did begin as a podcast. It really, truly began as this experiment to just learn all I could about manifesting, share that on the podcast, on social media. And um, then it organically just became a business. And it wasn't just like, oh, I woke up and hey, it's a business. You know, it was a, it was a lot of stuff to work through. Let me just tell you, like a lot of stories I had to work through, you know, am I good enough? Can I do this? Who's going to listen to me? Um, you know, am I qualified enough? All of that sort of stuff. But eventually I mustered up the strength to um, officially launch my coaching business in March of 2019. And um, yeah, like things kind of exploded, really. Like upon reflection, they exploded. I think when you're in the experience of it, you're going, uh, yeah, like, let's hurry up, please. I've got some big goals this year. <laughs> I've got some goals I need to kick. Like, when is this going to actually happen? But that was the thing for me, Karen, like that was really where it began for me was I did have the dream. I really did have the dream. I wanted my first year in this business to be a six figure year. I had no idea. Like it seemed like a mammoth task to take on. It really did. I had no idea how it was going to happen, but I just committed to that dream and just held faith. And it was, and it, and it did, it came to fruition. Um, I didn't think it would, I've got to say like, 
March through to December of last year, my business did great. I, mean, I think I was sitting at about maybe close to, I think it was about $90,000 in revenue between that period, which was pretty incredible. But I still, at that point in time, I still wasn't sure. But lo and behold, I went away, took some time off, took about a month or so off, came back to work end of January and then February, things exploded again and I ended up finishing the year somewhere close to about $120,000. Like my first, you know, year from, you know, March to kind of March, around that $120,000 in revenue. And then this year, like if I go from January to now, like I've, you know, I'm close to doing that in cash already. So yeah, there's been a lot of explosions along the way, right? But it has been that messy journey and I've pivoted and I've changed direction. But like, even when I say that, I don't feel like I've pivoted and changed direction. I've just let um, action breed more clarity, right? That's what it does. Like we need courage to get into action. And the action is what breeds that clarity. Like so many people think, oh God, I need to figure my niche out and figure this out before I you know, go and launch this program or do that. And by all means, please, like there is a place to work those things out. There is no doubt in my mind, but sometimes you've got to go out and test things. You've got to go out and see what the response is. You've got to get the no's, have the failures. Trust me, I've had the failures. I think it was not the linear journey, right? It was not the linear journey. I mean, I, my one-to-one coaching when I first launched it, it sold out, but it was really cheap. So of course it was going to sell out. Like it was ridiculous. Like of course it was going to sell out. Um, you know, my first group coaching program did really well. I did somewhere about $40,000 revenue off that. So that's like a success without a doubt. But then I had a big failure at the end of the year. Um, You know, I was struggling again to attract clients one-to-one. I launched um, another group coaching program as well. And I had big goals for it. And I threw money behind it, ad spends, a whole lot of stuff. And it flopped like big time. I barely covered costs on that on that launch, but I've always held on to the belief that things are happening for you. And it really did because it was that experience of taking that action that bred that next level of clarity for me, right? That allowed me to get very, very clear and intentional on what that next stage of evolution and business growth was going to look like, which has landed me to where I am right now. So yeah, messy, right? Yeah. It's just the way it is. Yeah. Yeah, it's I it's refreshing to have someone be very honest about that because I think for a lot of my audience they're out there thinking that um, it should be simple, it should be quick, it should be that straight line, and it's not. So what's wrong with them? Are they yeah. doing the wrong thing? Are they uh, are, are they even meant to be in business? Yeah. And do you know what? Can I just say something? You probably are doing the wrong thing, but guess what? That's where the lessons are. I'm totally, totally fine with messing it up and sometimes making mistakes. Oh boy, have I made mistakes. Like some mammoth mistakes, some really, really big mistakes. And I have done the wrong thing. I've, you know, written the wrong content. My messaging has been off. Um, you know, my sales pages haven't been, you know, written really well. Yeah. Def- like, but that's okay. Like it's okay to do that if you're open to just taking that action and realizing like, cause you know, you've heard me say that there's actually no, like, I know I say it's the wrong thing, but I want you to hear me on this. Like there isn't a right or wrong thing to do. There's not a right or wrong decision. There's not a right or wrong path. Like business isn't black and white. It really isn't. Okay. Mm. There's just a choice that you make that's either going to yield the result that you want or it's not just like that's really as simple as it gets and it's just are you brave enough to take that action knowing that it's going to take you down another path and that's a really integral part when it comes to like manifesting and the concept of faith and surrender as well is that i'm okay i'm okay if this is going to flop like i'm totally okay if this is really successful and or it's not like i'm okay either way because i know like the overarching or underlying how we know like foundational belief that i operate from is my success is inevitable like it's Mm. for me it is like it just sits at the bottom and just drives every action i take so if my success is inevitable then what does it matter if I go off on this direction and it doesn't take me one I Like it's course, course correct all the time because I'm like clear, that's where I want to be. Like if you had have asked me, you know, 12 months ago, 
did you think you'd be where you're at right now? I would have said, yeah, I held the dream I would be, but I had no idea how I would get here. Like, mm -hmm. You just hold space for the vision, right? You just hold space for the vision and you just let yourself be guided along the way and just trust yourself and each step that you take that, you know, you can do this and that whatever happens, you'll be okay. Yeah. So there's two really key pieces to that. One is that you're just holding the vision and yes. trusting that somehow you're going to get there and you mm. don't have to have a plan all the way to the vision. You no. just have to have the next right step. Yeah. Yeah. And you can't, here's like, this is so goes back to like the right or wrong approach too. You can have a plan and you don't have to have a plan. Like you can't, if that, some people that yeah. works really, really well. Like I'm at a stage in business now where I have more structure, mm. okay, than I did last year. But that's because I'm also clearer, right? But I only got clearer because I took the actions. I had the courage to do the scary things, to fail, fail often, fall often, okay? I, I had the courage to do that. And that's what bred the clarity for me to be at the place where I'm at right now where I'm like, okay, so I have more of a plan and more of a structure in my business. But it's okay to not have that and it's okay to have it. But the one thing I say, like, and this is important even now at this stage in business, you know, as my business now scales and grows to multiple six figures this year, like I've got the structure, I've got the plan, but I've also got my intuition. Like I know the business I want to create, right? I know the business mm -hmm. I want to create and I might not know every step of that, but when something comes to me and it feels good, I'm like, damn right, I'm going to take a closer look at that and see whether I want to really do that. Do I want to offer something that's not in my core offer? Do I want to play around with this and see where this takes me? Like, do I want to do that too? And I allow myself the flexibility to do that because that works for me. Yeah, I love that. I want to just pick up on one other thing that was underlying uh, what you said previously. Mm. And this is this detachment uh, of your own self from your business success. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I know. Like, yeah. okay, this is huge, right? This is huge. And it was huge for me. So I'm going to, assume, and it's huge for all of my clients too. So I'm going to assume it's huge for the people that are listening to this because I've been in some form of business for myself for 10 plus years. Okay. I've had a bricks and mortar um, business before um, for quite a long time. So I was so attached to my business. Like my business was an extension of me. You know, if it failed, I failed. If it succeeded, I succeeded. You know, if it was doing well, I felt good. If it wasn't doing well, I was feeling pretty terrible about myself. Okay. And um, that's totally fine if you're there. But I, I had to, for me, I had to make the shift because I was like emotionally burnt out. And I had started the manifesting. This was only like an, like, you know, it's the only shift I really made last year. But um, I'd started this business because it was something that felt good. Like to be able to do a podcast every week and just talk. I mean, that's my dream. My God, you know, to be able to do that. But I had lost some of that spark because I was so attached to whether this launch was going to do well or not, whether my clients were going to get results or not. And I'm not going to sit, I don't want to sit here now and say to you either, because you know, I keep it very real that I am completely emotionally detached from my business. I'm not okay. I'm a human being. I have feelings. Okay. We all do. So, and I'm, I'm like, my business is somewhat like my sixth child. So like, it's important to me and I do care about the people I work with, but I practice being okay with no matter what's going on in my business because I treat business like an experiment. I treat it like an experiment and it, that has been a game changer for me. It's been a game changer for a lot of my clients as well to be able to make that transition from, Oh my God, I need to do this. What's going to happen? What if it doesn't work out? What if I fail? You know, Oh my God, what if it succeeds? Like people have those thoughts too, to being like, all right, so I'm going to treat this like an experiment. I'm going to put my scientist hat on and I'm going to go, okay, here's what I'm deciding I'm going to create. I'm going to create this program. I'm going to make this offer. I'm going to do this launch. I'm going to run it this way. Okay, I'm going to play around with this. So I'm going to ask myself, what would it take? Like, what would it take for me to sell out this program? What would it take for me to run my launch this way? What would it take for me to consistently have, 
you know, multiple five figure months. What would it take? Okay, here's the things that are coming to me. This is what it'll take. Okay, who do I need to be? Like, what do I need to be thinking on a regular basis? How do I need to be feeling? Like, what are my core foundational beliefs I'm going to reset to? And I just play around in that space. I just play around in that. And I observe from a real place of curiosity. Okay. Um, and it looks like really on any given day, how am I feeling? Yeah, I'm feeling good. I'm feeling aligned. Right. Let's go. Let's just do what I got to do. Okay. I'm not feeling so great. I'm not feeling very aligned. I'm feeling a little bit scared. I'm feeling a little bit confused. All right. Let's like have a look at what's going on and then just kind of treat it as an experiment day in, day out. You know, I've said that I need to do these things consistently. That's what I believe I need to do in order to create this outcome. Am I doing those things? Yes, I'm doing them. Great. No, I'm not. Why, why am I not doing them? What's actually going on? And I just play around. I just kind of play around and observe and get curious and then make choices, right? Like just mm. be responsible. Yes. Just like make choices. You know, I'm not here to say you've got to feel great 24 seven because you sure as heck don't and you shouldn't expect that of yourself. But you can make choices like... I can make a choice that, hey, like my energy has been a little bit funky the last week, which by the way, it has I'll openly admit that. Um, and so what am I going to do with that? Am I just going to sit with that? Am I going to make the choice to sit with that and let that be okay? Or am I going to choose to shift it? Well, I made the choice this week to just sit with it and let it be okay. Understanding based on the law of cause and effect that that will cause some sort of an effect. Whatever that effect is, is part of the experiment, right? We'll just wait and see mm. what happens. And that's exactly what I do. I just kind of stay in this space and it's practice, right? So I just said to you, like, there's no end game with this. There's no, you know, okay, like I'm going to be now completely emotionally detached from my business. No one is, by the way, anyone that says that, no, most people with right mind will tell you they're not. Like, they're, they, like there's some emotional attachment to their business. Like that's just the way we are. But what I do is just play around in just being solid in my worth, in my value, in what I offer and let the results be what the results are going to be. I'm either aligned with it or I'm not aligned with it. Like there's not a lot of gray area in the like I either am or I'm not. And if I am, it will manifest. And if I'm not, then I'll just take a closer look at where I'm misaligned and course correct if I choose to. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So very, very valuable. Thanks, Gemma. Um, that's such a good conversation to have because I think that's, it's just a journey that every business owner is on and there's, and let's not make meaning about whether that's good, bad, right, wrong. It's just a journey. It just and is. You just go through that process of coming to trust yourself and coming to be able to see things as an experiment and letting go of that attachment. Um, mm. but also knowing and keep still holding that vision as well. Yeah. Yeah. And that, that really is where the work is, okay? Like holding the vision. So just to give you an example, like this year, you know, you're part of my mastermind, right? So I launched my mastermind uh, in March and um, COVID hit, right? Like middle of it. And I wanted to sell the mastermind out. Like I had, I was holding space for the vision. Now, my only job, and I had cut open period for just over four weeks, and most of that was like I was having conversations with people in the middle of coronavirus where people's businesses are going under, like uncertainty amplified. Mm -hmm. My only job was to just keep holding space for my vision. That was it. That's all I just keep doing that, keep doing that. And yes, please, like fears came up. More than my fair share of fears came up. You know, who's going to spend in this environment? All of that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. But I just kept resetting back to holding space for my vision, holding space for my vision, just, you know, being present with the people that were applying for it and just can I genuinely help them? Yes or no? If I can, then like, let's do this. And if not, then that's fine too. And just continuing to do that. And as a result of just staying focused on that vision and letting the results be what the results will be. I mean, it turned out to be my most successful launch by a long shot. Um, yeah, it, it really just, that's your job. And when it comes to manifesting, that is like manifesting creation, whatever you want to call it, your primary focus is to just be the vision, hold the space for the vision and just sit in it as often as you can and just live as though it's done. Absolutely. So yeah, uh, yeah, live as though it's done. Mm. Yeah, yeah. That's, that is one of the key pieces to that. That's, that's an awesome conversation. Um, 
I'm so grateful that you shared all of that. Um, I'm going to pivot the conversation slightly now. Hmm, yeah. And I want to uh, take you back to a social media post that you posted oh, two, two, maybe three weeks ago hmm. uh, that sparked me reaching out to you about this episode. Yep. And this was quite a mic drop post. I think there was a bit of swearing in it, which, <laughs> which sometimes definitely sounds like me. <laughs> yeah, that sounds like you. Uh, and it basically was talking about the fact that size doesn't matter when it comes to your audience. Mm. Yeah. And as I've been talking to my audience uh, recently and asking questions about launching and um, what they're putting out there and what their results have been and all of those kinds of things, I've discovered that there's quite this feeling out there from people that when they have a launch that fails, which all that means is it just didn't get the results that they were yeah. expecting or wanting, that they come back to this underlying feeling that their audience wasn't big enough. And the, the solution to the problem for next time is that they grow their audience. And mm -hmm. I know that you have some pretty strong opinions about this so can you elaborate a bit on that and what your experience has been and why you think that size doesn't really matter? Yeah, well, it's not that I think I know. I know for a fact that size doesn't matter. It's, it's factual. <laughs> like you can't discount it um, at all. Um, I think it, like first and foremost, it is so easy to see and to immediately jump to, okay, I need to grow my community to be able to create the result I want. I need more people. There's so much tied up in that and so many different directions that we can go, right? But to give you some context, as I was saying, like my business as of since March, I'm gonna have, I've got to do final figures and see where I'm at, which will be finalized in the next couple of weeks with end of financial year. Mm. But like I'm sitting, I'm sure my business has like generated over just over $200,000 in revenue since March last year. And I just want to also say, by the way, that's like I have low margins in my business. So it's not like I've, like I've generated, you know, $210,000 and I've spent $200,000 of that. Like I pay myself, you know, a very, you know, sustainable, consistent wage, I pay staff and I've got money left over, a profit sitting there. So I have fairly low margins in my business. Um, you know, but I don't have a large audience at all. Mm. You know, like what is a large audience anyway? But like, let's quantify yeah. that. Okay. My email list, ha I mean, I, to be honest with you, to be frank, I go and check it. My VA spends any time that needs to be spent in the back end of my system, but it's probably sitting at around maybe 1,100 people on my email list, maybe. And that hasn't grown a lot, by the way, either in the last, like, six months at all. Um, you know, okay, like I've got 5,000 people on Instagram and, you know, a couple of thousand people in my Facebook group, but not, like, it's not a very large audience at all. Um, and I truly know for a fact that you don't need that, but it's, as I said, it's very easy to go there. Now, what do I want to say about this? There's so many different ways to skin a cat. It's a terrible saying, right? But it tells the story <laughs> like there is. And this is exactly what I said in this post, because this is, really goes into my concept of there's no right or wrong way to do this. Okay. But it's like, okay, well, if I want to generate a hundred thousand dollars in my business, I can either go, okay, I've got a small audience. So what then is the, what do I need to do? Well, it comes down to pricing then. Like I could sell 10 people a $10,000 program, boom, done, right? Or I can try and sell, you know, a thousand people, a hundred dollar program. And therefore, obviously I'm going to need a larger audience size. So the question isn't the audience size. Like for me, I'm going to be frank, I'm going to call the spade a spade. The question really comes down to value. Like how much are you valuing the work that you do? Like if you've got a small audience, that's totally fine. You can still have those big income goals, but what you've got to do is you've got to check in with what you're at, how you're actually valuing the work you do, what you're offering and reverse engineer it from there. And that opens up a whole conversation about like money stories and money blocks and self-worth and all of that sort of stuff. But the truth of the matter is, is that that's got to be a component of that discussion if you've got a small audience. The next thing I want to say about that as well is that the truth of the matter is, is that 
when you value the work you do, how you also market yourself becomes really compelling, right? Mm -hmm. And that's the other thing. That's the other thing with a small community. Like we just said to you, if you're like $100,000, like effectively you could sell a $10,000 pro you only need 10 people. You know, but all you got to do is you've got to market to those 10 people and you've got to be able to see the value in your work, communicate that effectively and those people will get attracted in as well. So, you know, it really like so much of this, and this is why the work I do is, you know, obviously quite deep work. I really work with people on a, you know, a deep subconscious level when it comes to the mindset side of things, because what I see is not, do you have an audience problem? Okay. What I see is, do you have a self-worth problem? And it's not even a problem, but you get the language that I'm using. Like, let's talk at that level. Like, let's talk at, look at how much you're valuing yourself, your work. Okay, what you're offering, your client's ability to get results. Like, let's take a close look at that. I want to see that. I want to talk about that. I want to get to the root cause. I want to understand what's going on there. Because if you value yourself and your work, you know, is, is of high service, then, like, it's worthy. It is worthy of, you know, being paid what it is and whatever it is yeah. that you choose to be paid. And I'll just keep talking because I do that best. But, like, that can was on to another tangent with this. And it really comes down to like this, and this is so true. I remember this isn't my advice. This came from a mentor that I worked with a couple of years ago, Jim Fortin, who some people um, may know. Um, and he, I remember being in his TCP and his program, and people were talking about pricing. And he basically said, you want to know, like people always ask, what should I charge? Go and look at my competitors, see what they're charging. Oh my God, I'm not as good as them. I can't do that. Or whatever the BS stories that come up with it. And I just loved the way that he just um, angled it and said, you want to know what you charge? You work out how much money you want to make, how many people you want to work with, divide the numbers, bang, there you go. That's how much you charge for something. And it can be that simple, right? It can be. Mm. But it's what happens is that we get into all the mind drama that comes up as a result of that, all the stories around that price that go, oh, my goodness, like I can't charge that amount of money. No one's going to pay that. I don't have those people in my community. I've only got people, I've only got low-end people in my community that only want to pay $97. Yeah, okay, maybe you do, but maybe that's only because you've been offering $97 programs and that's all they can pay. Mm -hmm. like, you don't know. Again, go back to this principle. Business is an experiment. What would it look like if I was to offer a $997 program to 10 people? What would that look like? You know, what would that program look like? What would the launch look like? You know, all of the stuff that goes with that and just playing around in that space. Mm, yeah. Yeah. It's so, there's so much in that whole pricing and, um, audience size and, and so much connection there and, you know, go straight back to what we were talking about, about, you know, removing that attachment. Yeah. <laughs> it's that total attachment of our own worth to the size of things or the price of things or the success yep. of things, whatever that yep. is. Yeah. And I've been there too. God, have I been there? Oh man, have I been there? Truly. I remember like building my Facebook group. And I just always had in my head, I've just got to get it. I remember I had post-it notes, right? I had post-it notes around um, in my little manifestation box. You know, congratulations, it's at 5,000, it's at 10,000, it's at 20,000. My group's even at 2,000, okay? So I've never, I've never reached those, mainly because I don't care anymore. That's why they're not even a part of it. Mm -hmm. um, but I did, in that space, I was like, I need this to be a large group in order for me to make six figures. I need, I was like, there has to be more people in this group. Um, and I, I had that in the back of my mind a lot. But thankfully, I also had the drive in the back of my mind to just get out there and help people and to really yeah. like fumble my way around as well and just see, again, what would it take? What would it look like if I could do this, you know, put this out there? Remember, the vision, what would it take to create a six-figure business? First year, like first 12 months of my coaching business, what would it take to create six figures in this first year? That was the experiment I was playing around with. And at one point in time, I thought that meant I needed probably 20,000 people in my group. Mm. Um, but yeah, a lot of that did come down to, well, if I'm going to be charging a low cost offer, then that's exactly what was, you know, inevitably probably going to need to happen. But, you know, I did play around with the pricing, was able to, you know, and I was quite scared too, putting offers out there. You know, I remember the first group coaching program I did was $1,111. 
And thankfully I had some success with that, but that was scary, right? That was mm. really scary putting that out there. You know, it's, it's a different game now. And yeah, there's like a few stories that come up with it, but you just keep growing and evolving into it. And the next thing I guess I want to say with that too, like you just, like, you just show up. Like, I've, you know my philosophy in business, okay? It's what I teach everyone. So I will share this with you now. Two things. When you're scaling your business to six figures and even early six figures, you've got two focuses and that's it. And that's show up and monetize. That's it. Just mm -hmm. show up and monetize. All right. That's all you've got to do. You've, you've got to, you've got to make yourself valuable to people. Like you've got to see your value and then make yourself valuable to people. And then I promise you, people will take out their credit cards and they will type their numbers in at checkout and they will buy. If you, if they see that what you're offering can help them and you can communicate that effectively and that comes from you believing in it, you seeing it, you valuing yourself, then you will. People will pay for what you have to offer and you don't need a large audience for that. Like despite the size of my audience, I know plenty of people that have got like, you know, it's much smaller. Like, look at you, like your, your Facebook group is smaller than mine. You're kicking it. Like there are people out there without a doubt that have small communities, okay? Have small communities, but they are engaging communities. They are, you know, there is a lot of value in there. So when it comes time to make an offer, you know, people are literally waiting there with their credit cards, just waiting for you to do that. That's where yeah. the focus has got to be. Yeah. That, yeah. So that leads per perfectly like literally perfectly into the final i guess piece of the puzzle that i want to drop in for people and so this is to come directly at social media because obviously that is what we're you know talking about hmm. um what does that look like for you on a daily basis to show up and monetize through social media what are the pieces that you are putting together in order to do that and what is it hmm. about that that means that size doesn't matter yeah. Um, okay. All right. So first and foremost, my belief is that you have to have, yeah, I'm going to go with how I'm going to put it out there. You have to have some sort of marketing engine in your business. For me, like you, it's a podcast, right? Um, I truly believe that that is an integral part. Now I'm please like social media is an integral part of my business but it's not, it isn't just all of it. Okay. It isn't just oh, all of it. Thank you for saying that. Yes. Yeah. Super it's important. not all of it. Okay. Mm -hmm. Like what I have done. And by the way, can I just tell you, I did not know I was doing this. I just wanted to create a podcast. I just wanted to talk. I had no idea. It's just while well, it worked really well was that I was giving people an opportunity to find me. All right. To, yeah. So I didn't have to go looking for people. And that's exactly what my podcast did. You know, I gave an opportunity for people to find me and I did not know I was doing this strategically. But the other thing I did is my podcast is called the Manifesting Mum Podcast. So people type manifesting into the search engine in Spotify and my podcast comes up, right? So like it was not realizing at the time, but it was creating also searchable right? Creating searchable mm -hmm. content that's really easy for people. Like thinking about those keywords, it's really easy. So I just wanted to really put that out there, okay? That that is a, it's real. I talk to my clients all. I've had so many clients start podcasts, not because I, I, I don't care whether it's a podcast or a YouTube channel or whatever it is that you want to actually create. It, it, I just truly wholeheartedly believe like having a marketing engine of some sorts where people can um, absorb your content is really, really crucial. It also makes buying from you a lot easier. Let me give you an example. Um, I've got 101 episodes of my podcast out, okay? When I launched my mastermind, one of the ladies inside the mastermind, I don't even know how, had stumbled across me one week before I opened up the challenge. Found me somewhere on social media, thought this was interesting, binge listened to my podcast, signed up for my mastermind the next week, okay? So you can't negate the power of having a marketing engine that is sitting there that has, you know, evergreen content that can be absorbed at the consumer's own pace. Mm. You just can't negate how important that is. Okay. But then when it comes to social media, uh, okay. 
what do I want to say about this? Here is what underlies my intention on social media before I talk about like the practical stuff. Like, and that is that I care, right? I care about people. Okay. I care like at the, even though I say like, what I say to you is that, you know, I help women in business grow their confidence. They can create consistent cash and ultimately grow their business to six figures. Truly like my ultimate purpose is I just want women to feel good about themselves. Like that's really what it is. I care at that level. And one of the ways that I do that is through helping women in business. So that intention of like, I truly care about people and I care about helping people is what drives everything on social media for me. That's what allows me to show up and be visible and to write like, you know, sometimes very confronting social media copy that calls people out and says, Hey, like if you're sitting on your hands right now, you're being selfish. There are people out there that need your help. Like I know. And it allows me to do that because like, marketing i mean social media is just a distribution channel that's all it is right we just write we just Absolutely. we just share our voice all we're doing is sharing our voice and so i care that's the that's the primary thing but the second thing for me is that i as much fear as i had never wanted to dull my voice you know you listen to my mm-hmm. podcast i swear it's messy it's very unedited Um, Although I do have a podcast manager now that takes care of all of that. But literally, I recorded in my walk-in wardrobe. You know, I just, you know, I just got out there and I wanted to be me. I wanted people to connect with me. I didn't want to put a huge, Mm. like, filter over the top of me. So that was really important. So that's an important part of my, so like, if you want to call it a strategy, look, it was never the intention of a strategy. It's just been the byproduct, really, is that, being authentic, like knowing that it's safe for me to show up and be myself and authentically sharing my points of view, my belief system, my results, my clients' results, like questioning people, calling them out, holding space for people. And I use social media as that channel to engage with people because like it's social media, guys, right? Like it's, I know people, you've heard this before, but just be social, like just be social on there. Like think about it. It's just, okay, if I walk into a room with people, how would I be in that room? Well, then I'll just be that same person on social media too. But, you know, social, it's, it's, as I said, it's a distribution channel. Like it's one of the ways that I get my message and my voice out there. And it's a way that I get to connect with people from all over the world and help them in some capacity, whether that is through my free content or whether that is through some sort of paid program or service that I offer at some point in time, I just show up and help and then I let it all just be what it's going to be. And I'm just present and active and visible consistently where possible. And I just keep it simple. Like when it comes to social media strategy, I just keep it like, you know, I don't like, do I have a strategy? I mean, I've got, I have a strategy if you want to call it that, but it's really just very simple and really just built on the basis of like getting people to be social inside my communities and then just helping people to get the shift and the result and the transformation they need through whatever way, shape or form that looks like. Yeah. It, uh, so simple, but so incredibly effective and powerful because it comes from the place of service and a place of engaging as a community. Yeah, it does. And that looks, and this is why, like, it looks different for everyone, right? Like, engagement yeah. looks different. Like, some people have, like, my group, not a lot of people post in my group, like, you know, ask questions and things like that. Like, I'm the one that's driving a lot of the content. But then you go into other groups where people are, like, posting, like, and that's fine too. Like, it's, there's no right or wrong way with that. It's what do you want to create? What is, what's authentic to you? What's real to you? What resonates with you? How do you want it to look? And then again, experiment, like play around, see what that looks like as well. Mm. Like social media, uh, you know, I'm, like, this might be very out of alignment with what you teach, but I'm going to go there anyway, okay? <laughs> <laughs> but I don't, I honestly, I don't buy into algorithms and um, a lot of that stuff. I really don't, okay? I get it. I res- I, it's not that I don't believe it, okay? I get it. I understand how algorithms work. But it's really, really bloody simple, right? Create content that gets people talking. That's all you focus on. Like, don't focus on the algorithm working to push your content up. Like, listen to your community. 
ask questions. You want to listen? Like you want people like, I hear this all the time. No one's in my group commenting. I'm like, are you asking any questions? Uh, no. Well, ask <laughs> some questions then. Like you want pe- like it's, please make it simple. Like you want people to engage, you want to create a community, then you create the space. You create the space that nurtures that and then continue to do that again and again and again and again and again. And you keep doing that. And which leads me, I guess, to another point, which I feel like is important to share too, is that so many people wait for their social media to be at a certain size, to be, um, you know, highly engaging before they'll show up. I'm like, no, 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 no. Okay. Mm. You know, one of the best pieces of advice I heard early on in the piece was from a lady who has, I don't know what she's got now, 30 plus thousand in her Facebook group. And I remember I remember her talking about that journey to get to her first thousand. And she said, all I did was I just kept showing up like I had a thousand people in my Facebook group. Yeah. And even when no one was watching or listening or commenting or engaging or liking or anything like that, I just kept showing up. I just kept showing up. And that's the, that is one thing that I am incredibly proud of that I've done is that and there have been times where, trust me, I tell a story a lot about, I remember, you know, doing a, wanting to do a Facebook live and I was doing it at night, which was, I mean, you've got young kids and you're tired. That's a big thing. Right. And I remember doing the Facebook live and my mother-in-law was the only person that was on and bless her. I love my mother-in-law to death. She ain't my ideal client. She's never going to buy from me. Bless her con socks. But I just remember like, man, why am I doing this? Like, why is no one listening Okay, and it can feel like that in business. It can feel like that in social media where there's so much noise going on. So many, it's like being in a crowded room of like, you know, two billion people, right? Mm. It's like being in a crowded room and you're trying to get your voice heard, you know, and it can feel like no one is ever listening. And the truth of the matter is it's the, the people that are consistent and consistently show up over and over and over again that get their voices heard. It's not the people that speak the loudest. It's the people that just hold space and just stay strong on their position and what they believe to be true and what they want to share and how they want to help people. And you just consistently do that over and over and over and over again, no matter what's going on. It doesn't matter, like... There are so many lurkers on Facebook. Like Facebook's full of lurkers. If no one's commenting, no one's engaging, it doesn't mean no one's watching. Just keep showing up. Yes. So interesting because I literally spoke to a client about this yesterday and I had seen a quote on Facebook talking about the fact that there is so much value in the silent watches. It doesn't oh, have to be the people that are... My goodness. And they yes. just pop up yes they, they do pop up if you offer them something to pop up for absolutely yeah i mean my mastermind is full of women that i've never heard of before like <laughs> one of the ladies in there rachel like this was on my email list never never she's over in the states never ever heard from her never spoken to her didn't even know she existed i sent an email there was an offer to jump on a call. She booked a call with me. She joined the mastermind. And now she's, you know, kicking goals and getting her business off the ground and doing amazing things. Like, <laughs> it is. And, it, and I do find in my experience that it is generally the people that don't say anything that are actually the ones that buy. It's quite often the people that speak the loudest that don't. And that's fine. Some people will always just be people that take in free content and that's totally yeah. fine. Like there is enough. And that's like, I think that's another belief that I've always just locked onto as well um, is just knowing like there's always enough and there's always more. There's always more. There's always more clients. There's always more money. There's always more opportunities. There's always more ideas. There's always more, more than enough. Yes. Can I add one final belief to that? And that is tied into this, but it's the belief that to really get the transformation, there has to be skin in the game. We yeah. have putting out offers to people and they have to be jumping in to really be connected. And mm. if those people are the lurkers, the people that maybe aren't commenting are showing up is just 
exponentially important to mm. making sure that they hear our message and that they have the opportunity to have those transformations. Yeah, and it is. I think it's a Tony Robbins saying the transformations in the transaction. Someone says that. I don't know who it is, but it is Grace absolutely. Wedmore says it a lot as well. Yeah, yeah. It's it's gospel. It is truth. And you know that to be true for yourself too. You know that yeah. to be true for yourself. And I think, yeah, it's incredibly important. I mean, there's so many different ways to go. I guess the only thing I do want to share about that too is that, and this is something I do see a lot too, is if you want people to invest in you, like you've got to also look at what you're investing in. Like, are you investing? Are you going out mm. and doing that? Like it's a real abundance mindset that comes with that. I think that's really important. Like, are you, you know, are you willing to pay the price that you're putting your program out or not as well? Like mm. I think there's also there's components of that that are really, really important to also take a look at when you're thinking about the pricing of your program and also like are people buying or not? Like what's your mindset when it comes to investing? Um, yes. You know, in, in programs for you to up level yourself and your business. And you have, a, if you have a really abundant mindset around that, like I promise you, you're in a very good place to be able to energetically attract that in because money's just like, it's just energetic flow. So if it's flowing out when you're investing in yourself, then you're going to see that flow come back in your way as well. So that's another important piece. I think that's also up for consideration when you're looking at, you know, whether people are buying your programs or not or what's happening. Yeah. Yeah. I, so like, yes. Anyway, so interesting because that is going to segue beautifully into the next episode of the podcast where I'm going to talk about my investment for 2020 yeah, and yeah. what has just the up level that came from the second that I backed myself to take that opportunity. Yeah, it is. And I'm the same too, by the way, like yeah. last year I made a significant investment of money. I did not have. Okay. I did not have, I mean, I had money for the first installment, but for the entire investment for the coach that I work with, I didn't, but it does cause you to significantly up level. There is, oh, it's, it's like one thing you just wish that you could, you have to experience it yourself, I think, to be able to fully get it. But so many people sit on the fence and play around, you know, in, you know, lower end like things thinking, oh, I can't afford, I can't afford. And don't realize that when you stay in your comfort zone, you stay in your comfort zone, right? Yeah, just always happens, you know, taking that what we might term a risk and really stepping up and stepping into something that causes you to really back yourself and go all in is what's catapult helped me catapult without a doubt has helped me catapult my business. And obviously the same for you too. Yeah, absolutely. Hmm. All right. Well, this has been a big and amazing conversation. Thank you so much, Gemma, for your time. All right. It was fun. Yes, Thank it you. was. I really appreciate the insights. Um, and for those of you who want to connect with Gemma, I will make sure that somewhere around this video or podcast, there are links for you to reach out, become part of her Facebook group, jump on her email list. Uh, and um, yeah, thank you so much, Gemma, for being here. You're welcome.